It's my honor and a big, big pleasure to welcome Professor Yang Jin Yu from Case Western Reserve University to the University of Bremen. Yang Jin, very, very many thanks for coming here. It's a great honor to have you here because you're one of the leading scholars in the area of digital transformation and digital innovation. And personally, it's for me always a pleasure to have scholars as guests that have influenced my thinking in a very impactful ways. And I guess every one of us has a favorite book or two, right? Books that you reconsult over the course of your life, and every time you read them, they tell you something differently. And I have the same thing with academic papers, in a way. And your paper on experiential computing from MIS Quarterly is one of those, that when I read them in different spots of my work, they always tell me something different. And I think the paper for me was a way of an intellectual game changer, because it was one of the first papers that I read that made me aware of the fact that a lot of the theories that we have about information technology are actually organization related, whereas much of the computing happens outside of organizations. And that motivated me a lot to dig deeper into that area, which then became one of my research foci on, on, on digital innovation in healthcare. And then, of course, everybody knows the famous digital innovation essay from information systems research, which then took it to a next level, I think. I mean, actually shaped the whole way information systems, I think, as a field functions today. So, Yang Jin is a professor of entrepreneurship and uh, information systems at the Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland and a distinguished visiting professor at Warwick Business School and the London School of Economics in the UK. Um, his work has been published widely in the leading journals of management and management information systems. So, for example, Academy of Management Journal, Organization Science and Information Systems Research. And you've also been as a senior editor active for MIS Quarterly and various other journals. So uh, the CV, and I actually had to edit it down a bit, shows already a lot of, of Yang Jin's accomplishments. And um, that makes me very happy that he agreed to visit us here in Bremen and give a talk on artificial intelligence or as organic machines in the future of firms. So in the name of, of all the professors here at the school and our students, I would like you welcome, to welcome you very much to, to the University of Bremen and thank you very much for taking time to coming here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Uh, I flew uh, in yesterday from uh, uh, Cleveland through Toronto and, and landed in uh, around Frankfurt around 11.30 or something like that and came by train uh, and it was a bit of an uh, um, experience. So, <laughs> train was delayed, um, and uh, it was. Uh, but uh, uh, Stefan, one of the uh, PhD students, uh, helped. Uh, I, I'm actually here with my wife, um, and uh, it was, uh, uh, he helped us to navigate uh, this whole um, unexpected uh, uh, event. So uh, I'm working on um, in an article, uh, and and then. Um, and hopefully, uh, it's been a um, work in progress, but uh, over the last 10 years, thinking about this topic, uh, about the future of a firm. Um, and, um, and I think I finally have a uh, right angle and story uh, and uh, something unique that I can talk about. Uh, and, and that's the idea of organic machines. Uh, and, and I'd like to use AI as an organic machine and the future of firms. So the title uh, got changed a little bit, AI as an in information infrastructure. Um, and, um, and I'd like to introduce the notion of generative economics uh, and, and contrast that with other form, um, other sort of economic uh, views, uh, if you will. So hopefully this will uh, generate some thoughts uh, and uh, take it more, uh, more as a provocation uh, more than anything else. So um, uh, AI has become quite a, a sensation. And this one is very close to my uh, home, uh, you know, South Korea, because uh, Lee Sedol uh, was uh, the one a human champion of uh, Chinese Go game. Uh, and he was a world champion as a uh, he uh, was deemed to be the most creative uh, player um, uh, in the world at the time, and he was ranked number one at one point. And he uh, had to face Google's uh, deep mind, um, and then it's a very complicated game. And people said uh, uh, a computer will never beat human for this game. It's far more complex than chess. 
uh, and uh, he won only one of the five games. Uh, and then he just declared that he's going to retire because he doesn't see the point of playing the game anymore. Because now uh, Google, uh, so he's, this one is one of the earlier versions of uh, Google's Deep, uh, Deep Mind. Um, and uh, I've, I, I uh, mentioned it in detail in the paper, but uh, in game two, uh, so Isetol is, is very creative player, so he doesn't do typical move. Uh, in the, uh, game go, is, there's a, like expected move, like these are the move that a professional player is supposed to do. And Isetol doesn't really follow those, he's an improvisational player. And uh, when uh, there was a uh, there was a move made by the machine that was widely seen as a mistake, it was game two, uh, and uh, uh, it turns out that it was the most brilliant uh, uh, move, and people really didn't understand why the machine made that particular move. Uh, it was like a hundred and twenty eighth move, uh, you know, taking turns of the second game or third game. And it was like uh, all the other moves that computer made was something that people could anticipate. But this was like a, the creative move the machine made and Isedol said, I never seen anything like that. I could not think any human would ever do such things and something like that. So <coughs> somehow he won one game <coughs> out of uh, five. <coughs> And then, uh, although it was best of, uh, you know, five, uh, they let him play all five games to see if he can win another game, but he could not win. And then they, uh, uh, and then um, this one uh, learned the game move by playing, uh, the studying the, all the human played games, right? The history of all the game ever played, uh, it uh, 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 learned. Uh, and then uh, the next version, was through uh, adver a generative adversarial network model again. So it was playing against each other uh, without ever training, being trained by any human being. And uh, that one beat this AlphaGo. So it is AlphaZero. So AlphaZero beat Alpha AlphaGo, and AlphaZero uh, beat another human champion. Uh, he didn't win any game. Uh, and so, you know, the AlphaGo made the Go game very boring. Uh, so Facebook, this is another episode, right? Facebook robot got shut down after it invented its own language and no one understood what it was saying and people got worried and got shut down. <laughs> and then uh, uh, the uh, uh, second machine age, uh, you know, Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McCarthy talks about how um, uh, highly complex cognitive tasks are being um, replaced. Uh, humans are being replaced by the AI machines for very complex machines. The old one, old machine age was uh, labor uh, automation, but now the cognitive work. In fact, we do have a, uh, a paper uh, that is under review for ISR. I think it's now third round. Uh, for Intel's uh, chip designers. So it was chips are being designed by AI nowadays through um, um, genetic algorithms. Uh, so um, this is uh, another Google. Uh, you know, I was in, in communicating with Aaron Lindbergh. Uh, it is quite well known now that um, Google is uh, providing this pre-populated uh, uh, response and these responses are not uh, the same for everybody. Uh, they learn your style, uh, and then it will generate responses, and then completes each sentence. The moment I say hi, and then if it is uh, you know response to Lowry, it says hi Lowry. The moment I type hi, right, and then it knows what I'm uh, expecting to say, and then it can you know constantly leading my way. Uh, in, and it is uh, digesting the email responses of many, many, many millions and millions of users, but also learning my own linguistic style and trying to predict what I'm about to say. Um, how many of you uh, actually use Amazon Prime? Large number, right? Uh, and then 
how many of you um, ever followed Amazon's recommendation that you know for purchase like when you purchase something that it says like you might be also interested in, right okay so um, according to a study it uh, it is people uh, click through those about 20 percent of time so what that means is that their uh, recommendation algorithm uh, is about 20 percent accurate so it's a prediction model uh, now <clears throat> Whether you like it or not, you are training the uh, Amazon's AI algorithm, right? If you uh, purchase it, you give it a candy, right? So you're right, do it again, right? If you ignore it, then it also learns something like, oh, I was wrong, uh, and then I need to do better, right? Imagine what would happen if that algorithm is 99% accurate. How Amazon would change its business model? Think about it, right? Will, will it uh, wait until you actually click? Or why not just shipping it to you, uh, knowing that you will like it, and then ask you to return it if you do not like it, right? So it'll be a, um, you know, shopping by return. So it'll be a different uh, business model, right? Um, so imagine today, you know, you want to go somewhere, um, you have choice of uh, modality, the mobility choice. You can use public transportation, you can use car, you can use scooter, which is quite, is it popular here too? Uh, you know, it's crazy in the US. Uh, and they just drop it and, you know, like it's everywhere. Walking hazard, right? You, uh, you can use Uber. But now think about the choices, you know, that you have. What if? What if there is an AI that would uh, orchestrate your mode of transportation based on the weather, based on your mood, based on the type of meeting you need to go? So I need to wear a suit, uh, and I don't want to be in a public transportation in a rainy, hot day, uh, sweaty, so I'm going to need a uh, comfortable a private car. Or it's a nice weather, uh, and you want a bike uh, or a scooter, uh, or, you know, today you haven't walked much, so why don't you walk to campus, right? What if an AI could uh, arrange such, um, you know, different modality of transportation? So uh, that service is already available. It's not as intelligent, uh, but it's a subscription-based. Uh, it's a Finnish company, uh, Wim. Um, it's a mobility, one of the earliest mobility as a service company. So you pay fixed amount uh, each month, and you get to use anything you want. Uh, you could use a car, you can use uh, transportation, you can use a scooter, you can use Uber. Uh, you just you make the decision yourself. Right? I am more than willing to bet that they have a learning algorithm uh, figuring out why you choose which one and then trying to make the recommendation for you. And eventually, over time, it will learn enough information so that it will make a prediction for you. We recommend you do this. Once it knows that their recommendation is above the threshold, it may start sending it without even, you know, even bothering asking you. So now um, imagine this. You're being discharged from hospital, and uh, you just had a congested heart failure, right? You've been monitored. In the US, uh, uh, about uh, uh, one million Americans are hospitalized uh, every year for congestive heart failure. And there are about 5.7 million Americans who have that disease. Uh, that number is going to grow to 8 million by 2030. It's a terrible disease. Uh, about uh, annual cost that U.S. economy is paying for the congestive heart failure is about 30 point uh, seven billion dollars a year. Uh, the biggest problem is that uh, it's a disease that is uh, uh, that cannot be cured uh, and uh, if you are uh, stage three and four I think they uh, categorize by five. Uh, beyond four and five uh, the life expectancy is like uh, you're gonna die within three years more than 50 percent chance it's a very, very bad um, um, disease. Um, 
The biggest challenge is that 67% readmission within 30 days of discharge. It's very expensive. And then 35% um, die after discharge within a year. Uh, and then the, the, the most striking statistics is that, that uh, readmission is not uh, evenly distributed uh, across 30 days. Day three is the highest readmission. So, so one of my friends said that uh, the, um, these heart failure patients uh, seem to purchase a subscription ticket back to the hospital. So you are discharged. 70% of the readmission happens within the you know, first three days or so. So the big question is how can we uh, discharge patients sooner? That's number one goal but then also keep them away from the hospital safe, uh, right? Um, so uh, in this case, patient journey should begin with a discharge rather than admission because the goal is to really understand what patients are doing at home. They have no clue uh, what happens the moment they disconnect the patients from the system when they discharge patients. Uh, by the time they, so this goes like this, uh, first two days, 48 hours, that's within 48 hours, the hospitals are expected to call patient at home and how they are doing. Something happens within the first 48 hours. So the, by the time the nurse call them and, or visit, they realize that there, something is uh, happening, so they bring the patient back. Then they start the whole process again. So. There's a, a lot of different kind of services taking place, homogeneous bundle responses to a very complex disease. People can go home, people can uh, go to hospital, home, emergency room, then they go to home, back to the hospital, they have a skilled nursing facility, uh, and then home. Uh, so it's like there's a whole bunch of different resources. There's a lab, there's an emergency room. Hospital wants to control this process in a more uh, systematic and dynamic way. What if we are able to offer dynamic bundling of heterogeneous services based on accurate prediction of preventable episodes, right? So think about that, right? You're, you're back home by yourself, and then by monitoring your uses of electricity, water, uh, movement in the house, what you eat, how often you open the refrigerator, you know, and then listening your voice and the conversation through smart speakers. You worry about their, uh, you know, privacy. Now these people are not, you know, uh, minding that someone is actually listening their conversation, you know, the doctors and so on. So what if we can actually do that, right? So bring all these things together. A lot of different data is coming in. Prediction is becoming a commodity, uh, and I think I want you to think about the term commodity here. Prediction is becoming a commodity. But certainly the uh, AI hype is here, uh, you know, so we turn to uh, Gartner when it comes to hype because they have hype curve and they are the hype machine. And if you look at the AI, it is right here. So it's, uh, so, uh, hmm. they didn't like, uh, okay, so. It's the edge AIs here, right? You know, so uh, we, we just started writing a paper about these little twins, so I think it's at the peak of hype. But it is so hyped that AI had to, uh, the Gartner had to create its uh, uh, AI, its own hype curve. So every technology that is here is AI-related technology. So it has its own hype curve. Uh, so, um, you know, speech recognition is, one that is now beyond, beyond the hype. Uh, but you, if you look at you know, uh, automated machine learning, chatbots, the pick of hype. Uh, so many of you have heard about what happened with the SoftBank, it's an investment on WeWork, supposedly AI company with just an app. Um, so they, they were uh, raising money, a $100 billion fund uh, only uh, all uh, all invested a oh, billion dollar I'm sorry billion dollar fund all invested in AI company supposedly uh, but this is a really big problematic hype they lost a lot of money um, 
U.S. funding, um, you can see the, in the private sector uh, how fast it is growing uh, here. Um, DARPA, which is big funding agency in the U.S., um, spent uh, $2 billion uh, last year, this year and last year, just announcing AI-related research. Um, the DARPA's goal is moving a technology from impossible to improbable, improbable. Uh, space. So what that means is that once something becomes uh, from impossible to improbable, then it will become probable. Uh, when, when that happens, that speed of commercialization uh, accelerates. And if someone else does that, pro uh, you know, turning improbable technology to probable, then it becomes national threat. So the DARPA wants to be the one who funds that movement from impossibility to improbability uh, and then creating a community of scholars and, and companies who own that paradigm so that they do not want to go back to the earliest. It's a very interesting model when you actually think about it, right? So once you experience the state of improbability, then those ones who saw the taste of the future cannot go back. And then when you have a community of scholars and entrepreneurs and technologists who are committed not to go back, then the technology will be commercialized. So much of the technology was uh, uh, developed in that way. So DARPA got into this game uh, last year in a big, uh, big way. So the joke is that you know, 10 years from now, uh, the scholars will be divided into two classes. Those who got AI funding during uh, 2019, 17, 18, 2020, and those who didn't. And I think it will be a very different uh, group of scholars uh, in the US and then elsewhere too. Uh, you know, way back when, uh, in early 80s, uh, in IS field, uh, IBM spent um, $100 million on group support systems. So there were two groups of scholars, those who got IBM funding and those who didn't get IBM funding. And so a lot of early works, uh, you know, so Minnesota, University of Minnesota uh, and Minnesota, University of Arizona, and New York University and uh, Pittsburgh and a few other places uh, got funding. And so when you look at uh, some of the strong IS programs in the U.S., they are the ones who received the funding from IBM at the time. And I think that will be what's going to happen in, uh, in the future. Early 2000, there was a big funding from uh, computational social science, network science from NSF and DARPA because it was part of related, uh, you know, related part of the uh, war on terror uh, because it was network organization that U.S. Army was facing. So I was part of the white paper and then it was, it was not even funny, right? You know, the, the language was so blatant, uh, obvious. Uh, so, you know, conventional hierarchical organization competing against network, agile network organization, how can we compete better? Right. So, so there was no re reference to war on terror or uh, Arcada or army, but, you know, bureaucratic uh, machine, mechanistic machine and agile, you know, evolution, the dynamic network-based organization, a lot of money went into the research on network science. So if you look at much of the work that we're doing now got started back then, right? And I suspect that uh, big data research, uh, you know, started around 2010, uh, I think has to do with WikiLeaks and all that sort of big data government gathering. Again, you know, the government has to figure out how to use data, figure out. And so a lot of money goes through the private sectors and academia to, to you know, get an early sense of what uh, is possible. So I think uh, you know the technology, the research we are you know in that uh, area of technology research. So this kind of uh, funding mechanism is one that uh, really facilitates the conversation. So it's a new spring of AI, I think. So the the, the, the my talk, it's, uh, I, I have a little bit of slow start. I think I have jet lag. I'm getting over. So uh, two uh, uh, two questions I'm, I'm trying to answer here. What? How can we better understand the nature of AI as an important technology of our generation? And then how can we then uh, understand the future of industrial firms? Uh, so those are the two questions. So part one is about the nature of AI. So what is the AI, right? Now, <clears throat> so I went to the uh, 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 dictionary, uh, Merriam-Webster. 
wasn't very helpful. A branch of computer science dealing with the, the simulation of intelligent behavior in computers, the capability of machine to imitate intelligent human behavior. All right, fine. You know. So then there is, uh, you know, MI's quarterly uh, editorial. Uh, so Arun Rai and and Panos and uh, Sauni, they wrote uh, AI. So if you read it, AI is typically defined as the ability of machine to perform cognitive functions that associate with the human mind, such as perceiving, visioning, learning, interacting with the environment, uh, problem solving, decision making, and even demonstrating creativity. And then there are four different categories of technologies, AI technologies, open source framework, and libraries of uh, machine learning models, uh, application uh, APIs, uh, and then drag and drop uh, development tools, and then pre-trained AI models. Those, these are the four uh, different types of AI technologies. Uh, and then it really has like a human-like capacity to act, perceptive capacity, reasoning and learning capacity, and effective capacity, right? So uh, speeches and, you know, movements and so on. I would argue that these are what I would call essentialist view of an AI. AI uh, as a discrete technology, there is like I can point to an AI as a, a thing, right? You know, like, so... Uh, uh, looking at uh, AI as uh, like a confined application, a system. I can point my finger, deep learning is an AI machine. It's a set of an algorithm. And I, I think it's a deeply problematic view of AI. Uh, first, two reasons. First, this is not consistent with our current understanding of human intelligence. We do not have an essentialist view of human cognition due to our understanding of the distributed social and material nature of human cognitions. Our brain, our cognition is not inside our brain only, right? It is distributed. We, we rely on other people's intelligence to get my job done, right? I constantly ask my wife, like, what I know, right? You know, like, who was that person that we met, right? Then she would remind me, right? It is what we call transactive memory system. I know who knows what, and then I access <laughs> You know, uh, that's, that's the term, transactive memory system, right? And, and so I rely on that. And then um, uh, we use the calculators, we use machines, which is an encapsulation of human history of intelligence. And then I mobilize the intelligence of others th through the means of technology. And then intelligence is highly distributed through the forms of, uh, you know, technology. So if you read, Tom, you know, uh, Thomas Malone's work on, um, you know, like a super intelligence or distributed cognition. It's all, all there, right? You know, there's a long history of social distributed cognition, which essentially rejects the view that uh, human intelligence is, uh, you know, within a skull. So how can uh, then a machine intelligence can be confined within a particular system? Number two, this is not consistent. Uh, this, that essentialist view does not explain why AI essentially is based on the decades-old technology. So the latest breakthrough tech, uh, in AI, so for those who are doing technical work, would know the neural net with a, you know, back propagation is more than 20 years old. And, and uh, how then the same technology that, was, that has been around for 20 years all of a sudden became very intelligent. It's not because that, that, that a particular technology has gotten better. It is the entire infrastructure has gotten better, right? It is uh, connected to a much larger, the information infrastructure, entire internet with much better ha uh, hardware and GPUs and, and then data is coming in. And, and so then we are got to a point where we can actually run these algorithms much faster. When I was a graduate student, we spent uh, one week exactly out of one whole semester when I took AI class on neural net. And uh, the point of that one week was that this is a brilliant theory, but totally impractical. Therefore, don't, don't, don't bother with it, right? That was the message. Now I learned that if you want to invest on the future technology, what should we do? You choose a theoretically brilliant technology and practically impossible. And if you bank on the technology, you're going to make a lot of money. Essentially, that was the case for AI 20 years ago. So, so the idea of essentialist view of AI just doesn't work in my view because it's not historically consistent and it is not consist consistent with our understanding of human intelligence. So I think we need a new understanding of AI in a di slightly different way, more non-essentialist view. So, uh, 
So let's think about uh, intelligence in biosphere, the human intelligence, uh, or in, in, in the world. Now, uh, the you know, philosophers, uh, mostly French, uh, Burson and, and uh, Deleuze, these are the people who really uh, uh, thought through the differences between uh, uh, the, the nature of human intelligence and the way they approach it is how a organic life, which is related to intelligence, emerges from the combination of inorganic matter. And this is their philosophical question, and it's informed by biology. So, you know, the, the, the origin of life is essentially, our life is made up of uh, or inorganic uh, materials, right? It's, uh, you know, um, and, and how the combination of inorganic materials give birth to a organic life. So here's how they talk about inorganic matters are characterized by repetition or near repetition where separated elements are rendered capable of returning to previous states or directly anticipating states to come. These repetitions, past and future, are already contained within the present. Observing their current configuration in enough details provides us with the capacity to understand their future arrangements. What this means is that the, the inorganic matter is, the, the characteristics of inorganic matter is our ability to predict its state. And it is based on the stability. Organic life, on the other hand, is a complex fold of chemical, which is inorganic matter, and the physical, which also is you know, uh, you know, inorganic, that reveals something not given within them. Something new emerges, life that uh, acts within matter that seeks to extend matter beyond itself and its present forms is not the origin of the virtual, but the rather one of its modes of actualization, the potentiality of matter itself insofar as matter is the material of life as well as non-life. So the whole idea of the, the uniqueness of uh, 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 organic life is its uh, emergent nature. Uh, that means it does not repeat itself. So when you think about your, your life, you don't repeat yourself ever, right? Your cell divides itself, so you are never the same person. Right? You, your life has forever changed because of my talk. <laughs> and, and for that matter, your life is forever changed every single moment because you can never go back to the previous state. Organ in organic matter, matter the, the point is that as long as I don't touch it, the stone will remain as a stone with the exact same configuration. It doesn't really matter. So, so the evolution of the biosphere is the process of individuation away from the singularity to multiplicity. Meaning that when we were uh, the inorganic matter, the presence of singularity, it is singular property. It doesn't change. But when it starts interacting with its elements, its emergence, its multiplicity, you never know where it is going. So our body, life, begins with a single cell conceived in my mother's womb and then it's a stem cell, and then it begins to divide. It's a whole process of individuation, repeats itself in the history of life and its individual, uh, individual uh, entities, right? So we are seeing this individuation process where different functionalities emerges out of the interaction among the same elements. This is the beauty and the wonder of life. And so what is real in their view, it's at Delanda's and Deleuze's view, is never what we are seeing. Your life is not real, but the possibility of that actualization is what is real. DNA is real, not the cell itself, because cell is temporary assemblage and actualization of what DNA can possibly do. So there are so many different possibilities that your body, your cell has, and all, only, only one of which is actualized at any point in time. So, so to say that what we see in the real world, physical world, it being real, is extremely limiting and it's in, in extremely temporary, right? So that is the, the essence of life, that the possibility of real uh, space that we uh, see 
through this actualization, right? Now, this what is possible then is in the in the realm of uh, the ecosystem, right? So this is like uh, Deleuze's the idea of like really complicated philosophical, and I don't pretend to understand what he says, uh, and I'm you know been trying to understand what he was saying, and for many years. Uh, and I still cannot understand, but that's okay. You know, we work with what we can understand. So he basically said, you know, look, you know, we have a tree that has trunk, that has a root, that has a soil, that has sucking, uh, you know, minerals from the soil, combining with the uh, water, and then it becomes flower, and then butterfly comes in, and all of this form what he calls rhizome. Uh, and then it is it is ecosystem, ecology of network of different heterogeneous elements. At any given point in time, that combination gives life a particular point, right? Now, if so, uh, so what goes and this goes far beyond what we think about neural network kind of analysis in the, in our brain. Yes, of course, in your brain we understand AI in the form of neurons and firing up and uh, you know forming and um, you know like a neural network. But the neural network is being formed because of the physical, material, chemical conditions that our body is exposed to. So what we, we, we are what we eat, and we eat where we are. We, our body, our intelligence is, uh, cannot be separated from the physical, earthly environment that we are uh, in, right? So that creates conditions we are deeply connected to the to the environment through what we eat, what we breathe, what we drink, and that controls the bodily expression of our cells and hormones, which controls our neurons, which then gives rise to the particular form of intelligence, together with our in, uh, social and, and material interactions with, with the environment, right? So when you think about intelligence, human intelligence in such a way, right, it is a highly distributed physical, material, at the same time, cognitive and cultural and biological, right? So, the, you know, these people uh, that I mentioned, Deleuze and others, do not really separate uh, the human intelligence from the environment. Because you are what you eat, in a way, right? It's highly, and then there's a fascinating um, uh, ecological evolutionary work that is connecting to how our microbiome is connected to our brain, mostly connected parts in our body is brain and guts, right? Through all these, uh, you know, uh, blood vessels. And so what you eat uh, in, and, and bring all these microbiomes into your body and they create ecosystem in your body and they control our brain uh, uh, in, in many, many ways. So I'm not gonna go into much more detail because my understanding of that area is this thin. But uh, what we are trying to understand here then is that tendency and trajectory, it's not deterministic, uh, you know, sort of like a materialistic, uh, you know, or material deterministic kind of view, but rather it is probabilistic view of there that gives us idea of tendency and trajectory, where we are going. So you could tell, you know, if you do the bio, uh, you know, biological DNA testing, they will do a biomarker and then they will say, you have a likelihood of getting particular disease based on the tendency and trajectories. That's all we get, right? And so in that process, an important construct is deterritorialization and reterritorializations, right? So our body and environment is breaking down the barriers, boundaries between the territories because we are mixing things uh, through our uh, you know, uh, whole process of living. And so that leads to deterritorialization and then it becomes the re-territorialized in the form of my cognition, in the form of my organic life. So deterritorialization leads to the blurring the boundary between inorganic and organic entities. So temporality is uh, obviously plays an important role because we never live our lives twice. So each actualization, the moment by moment is unique. Right? And, and memory plays a hugely important role. All of this comes back in the intellig artificial intelligence. And life and its intelligence has history, history certainty, but not historic as they are always uh, present. Right? Uh, so, so there are two tentative conclusions that we can draw from this. One is inorganic and organic are differences in degree, not differences in kind. 
And then intelligence is a temporary actualization of assemblage of uh, heterogeneous elements, but some organic, some uh, inorganic. Now let's think about intelligence in infosphere. Right? We've been talking about physical biosphere world. Now let's think about infosphere. So infosphere is the world of signs and symbols that we create. Infosphere used to be separated from biosphere. The history of the IT revolution is the increasing penetration of infosphere into the domain of a biosphere. Now this is uh, now finally some IT related uh, slide. So if this is a history of uh, IT in the uh, corporate world over the last 70 years, when IT first came in, it came in in the form of computing technology, which was separated from communication technology and production technology. Right? So you are a car manufacturer, you have a, a technology of making cars, and then your car as a technology has nothing to do with computing, has nothing to do with computation or communication. All the computing was done inside a computer, and then usually it is accounting uh, uh, and, and, and um, um, data. Uh, and then we use telephone and you know, uh, fax and, and, and other forms of communication to communicate between different units. Last 40 years of enterprise systems is the history of convergence between computing and communication technology. Started with Ethernet, local area network, and then internet, and broadband, wireless. And what we have seen is the emergence of you know, 3G, smartphone, web, and social media, and global supply chain, and you know, virtual teams, and all of that. Every single topic that we have studied under the sun in IS domain is looking at what happens when computer and communication technology converge, and how that might change the way we live and produce work and, and uh, products. Now what is happening? with the technology is that uh, we are seeing one another round of convergence and that is production technology is enveloped with communication and computing technology. And then key technology that is driving that convergence is 5G, IoT, blockchain, AI, big data, right? So what used to be separated like a product, you know, so experiential computing uh, paper is, uh, you know, like a computer coming out of the beige box and moving into everyday product artifacts. So I saw that happening in early 2000. People were inventing you know, new st stuff like smart TV and this and that. So the you know, ordinary tables and desks are now uh, equipped with uh, you know, IT uh, you know, capabilities and software and sensors and so on. And, and then uh, increasingly our own production technologies are being enveloped by intelligent smart machines that are connected to the internet. And I think that is what is really happening. So this is the uh, the Im invasion of infosphere into the biosphere of the physical world. So what we are seeing is deterritorialization of biosphere and infosphere through the increased interpenetration of symbolic entities of infosphere and then organic and in inorganic entities of uh, uh, biosphere. So then deterritorialization leads to the emergence of rhizome that involve both biosphere and infosphere, and it is what I would call organic machines. So organic machines are the, the result of deterritorialization and reterritorialization of creating something that we never had before. Machines that are acting as an organic entity that has a memory, that has an intelligence, like a behavior. Again, what does that mean? It is, it is about all about emergence. It is all about not knowing what the machine is likely to do again. It is about being, uh, 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 you know, instant temporary actualization of heterogeneous elements that are spread around the ecosystem. And that's precisely how AI in the internet is acting together with other machines. So the in, in, inorganic machines, both in bio and infospheres, are the machines constituted with inorganic matters and thus characterized by repetition or near repetition whose future state can be predicted with enough observations. Whether it is computers or simply mechanical machines, if you know von Neumann machines are highly predictable machines. If you know the data, if you know the algorithm, you know what the future state is going to be. They are maybe smart, but they are not organic. They are not emergent properties, right? 
So we are seeing, we have seen this inorganic machines dominant in most much of the industrial uh, economy. Organic machines, on the other hand, are complex folds of symbolic and inorganic machines. Now you can see how I am developing I, my idea just so that you uh, can see some trick, right? So I'm literally copying the work of previous philosophers who studied the differences of inorganic uh, and, and organic uh, matter uh, into the domain of inorganic machines and inorganic machines. And literally, I'm adapting their words into uh, the domain that I'm inter interested in. So organic machines are complex folds of symbolic and inorganic machines in the infrastructure of infosphere and inorganic physical machines in biosphere that reveal something not given within them, something new emergence. And that's the definition of organic machines. Organic machines are the one that does something that the inventor did not intend to do. <laughs> so when uh, AlphaGo made that you know, 108th move, the inventors were like, oh, I didn't uh, realize that the machines are able to do. Deep, uh, deep learning uh, machine, um, some of you might have seen this uh, demo by Google. Uh, uh, when, when they asked the machine to call uh, the restaurant to make a reservation. Have you seen the demo? So uh, the, the algorithm was calling on behalf of the user and said, I'd like to make a re reservation for my client. So the person, uh, without knowing it was a machine, says, how many people? It says, uh, four. When? It says, Wednesday evening. And then uh, something totally unexpected happened, that the, that the interaction didn't um, was not part of the training data set, which was the person said, well, you know, Wednesday night, it's not a very busy night. You don't need a reservation. The machine didn't expect that. So the, all the developers, I actually heard this uh, story from the team, the deep learning team. So they were watching the conversation as it was happening, and they didn't know what the machine would do. And they thought, they thought the machine would break down or something stupid, right? The machine says, oh, is it really busy? How busy is it on Wednesday? So that was the response the machine made, which was totally unexpected by the machines. And then they said, wow, this machine is really clever. <laughs> How did that do that? Right? Um, so emergent intelligence of organic machines, AI, is an outcome of the individuation process from singularity, multiplicity. A machine, inorganic machine, is defined by singularity. Right? We talk about singularity in a different context, right? Singularity is when the human in, uh, machine intelligence exceeds human intelligence. The way I think about singularity is like a singular characteristic and property and performance and state, right? A machine is a machine is a machine, right? You know, like a phone is a phone is a phone. That's a singularity. But smartphone went through the individuation process and it has multiplicity. Every one of you have a phone that is different, and that phone changes its performance every single time you are loading different app. It was a phone a moment ago, and now it is a you know, texting machine, and now it is camera, now it is game, uh, you know, so and so and on and on. Now, of course, it requires you to perform those actions of loading and unloading. What if we have a machine that understands what you need and then brings up the app that uh, based on the context queue? So the current AI phenomenon are the results of two key transitions. One, continuing deterritorialization of biosphere and infosphere, and the resultant penetration of infosphere into the uh, biosphere. The second one uh, is the emergence of organic machines at the intersection of bio and infosphere through the assemblage and coding of multimodal data. So deterritorialization. Multimodal data here is a key, right? So we have a data stream that are coming from bio, bio, uh, biology. So you have clinical data, for example, you have a microbiome, you have a DNA data, uh, and then you have a behavioral data, which is totally in a separate domain. Uh, we never link these things together. And then you have a social data, right? Where you live, what you eat, what is your income level, and these are the type of things. When you bring these things together, you are now beginning to understand how human actually behaves and how uh, you know, we, uh, our body changes. Uh, and then again, the tendons and trajectories 
are going to be two important issues. And we need to have, therefore, ecological realistic view. Again, what is real is not the essence of technology, the algorithm, single system, single tool, but rather it is uh, ecology that is real, that gives rise to the temporary actualization of the assemblage. So organic machines are the temporary actualization of assemblage among heterogeneous elements in infosphere enmeshed with organic and inorganic elements in biosphere. So temporality and multiplicity of a published insights that are generated from the machine is key, right? So in the healthcare example, so this is like N of one, the, you know, like a super smart, you know, statistic of one, how do we do it? It's uh, like all different data, behavioral science, population genetics, and, you know, molecular, uh, you know, genetic science, and bring it all together uh, to understand what it ha is happening in your body, right? So fancy term in, uh, in uh, uh, med medicine now is non, um, non uh, uh, biological determinant of health, meaning that you know where you live, what you do, what you eat, and, and your behavior is uh, what determines the uh, the health outcomes, right? So I was talking to a, a colleague of mine. He's like a pre Nobel guy, right? He has been nominated for Nobel Prize for Medicine a few times, and and we we're talking about like uh, um, prevention of heart attack. How can you predict a heart attack? In fact, by, uh, you know, uh, some of he and his colleagues' work uh, was the one, the biological determinant of a heart attack. So there is a particular, you know, a, a red blood cell, the a protein enzyme in a red blood cell that goes crazy. And, and that's how I understand layman term. And then uh, it creates some, some, something in your uh, blood, and then that, that, that is a, a biological trigger of a heart attack. That can be measured, right? Uh, now, the problem is that it, it ha happens about 50 minutes, and an hour before the actual heart attack, and some people can feel it, some people sense it, and, and, but you need to do the, the analysis. That's the biological pathway, but what caused that particular red blood cell to go crazy is not known, and, and they're trying to understand what is leading that red blood cell to go crazy. Right. And, and they believe it is non-health determinants, right? It is a behavior, it's environment, it is what you do, it is what upsets you, it's emotion. It's, it's, so this is like how our uh, health uh, is now moving in. So multimodality of data is biological, social, and behavioral, and bringing it all together in a big uh, container and trying to understand what is happening in, in the real world. So that's sort of like an understanding of the emergence of organic machines in the sense of infosphere and biosphere. So now let's think about what does it mean for the future of a firm, more related to the business talk. I'm going to be uh, uh, faster now. So uh, what is a firm? A firm um, is uh, an entity that goes through uh, the, uh, uh, that creates value from a commodity into marketable goods and services. So the value creation process is what the firm uh, performs the steps and activities within and across firms and industry that lead to the production of marketable goods. So uh, a firm uh, is a, a social technical assemblage, uh, uh, assemblage to perform the value creation process repeatedly at scale. Right? You can do it once, we don't call it a firm. Uh, firm. Uh, you do it at scale and repeatedly in the same way. Um, a value creation process requires a binding of material form and the non-material symbolic functions. Every product, every offering, every value creation requires the matter and the sim symbolic understanding coming together uh, to, to create some value. So value creation comes from meeting uh, unmet needs through this uh, binding of form and function. So industrial firm as a social technical assembly critically depends on the capability of the machines that we have at the time to perform this value creation process. So the so, so firm, therefore, is an entity that identifies opportunities in the market, mobilizes resources to design, build, and deliver solutions in order to meet the opportunities in a sustainable scalar manner. It should have actually come uh, earlier. Right? So, so that is a firm, and then that firm goes through the value creation process and it, it, it is uh, depending on the machines that it has access to. Now, 
So when you look at the relationship between the machines and our organizing logic, we can think of three different views, economic logic. Uh, so the first one is what I would call industrial economics, right? So we all know what industrial economics is. Industrial economics is really coming out of the understanding of a physical machines. Physical machines are inorganic machines in biosphere. So these are the machines that re, uh, transforms a scarce natural commodity, natural resources into useful materials or marketable products. Right? It, it is using the power of fire essentially to transform it. That is what physical machines do. So the logic is driven by the scarcity and it is doing automation and it is highly capital intensive and then this is what Chandler has studied. So managerial challenge that these uh, companies are trying to address uh, the, the using the logic, uh, economic logic, is maximizing asset utilization because it's the, the most expensive assets, the machines. Uh, and then organizing logic, therefore, is ver vertical integration and diversification. So if you read Chandler, this is what he studied. Economic logic that came out of it is economies of size and scale. And organizational forms then uh, is uh, vertically integrated and from hierarchy. Management tool is at the time is the scientific management. So that is the story of uh, and, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the industrial economics. Information economics came in 80s and late, uh, you know, late 80s and early 90s as this computing and communication technology becomes main uh, uh, technology that uh, drove the development of our industrial machines. So, which is uh, related to the emergence of uh, Zuboff, uh, labeled as uh, smart machines. So, it is inorganic machine in infosphere, phone nomen computing uh, machines, right? It is a predictable state machine that we can understand what it is going to do given the algorithm and data at any given point in time. Information is, however, always a byproduct of activities in the value creation process. And uh, the, the, therefore, the logic here is ubiquity of information. Why? Because they see information is cheap. It is very inexpensive to reproduce. So managerial challenge is uh, uh, containing the complexity and information overload of industrial organizations that came in the previous era. And organizing logic here is the modularization uh, and then design rule. If you read the book by Kim Clark and Baldwin Claris, they talk about how modularization is important aspect. Simon actually talked about it quite heavily. And then um, that modularization uh, create the opportunity for horizontal coordination of different activities across different um, you know, um, realm of organizations. So the economic logic here is a zero marginal cost of production or reproduction, and then a non-rivalry of consumption of information. This is Shapiro's work uh, and, and uh, you know, information rules. This is very important uh, you know, uh, uh, foundation of our um, discipline. And the, uh, the organizing form that came out of uh, the information economics is this network of distributed organizations, right? Management rule, outsourcing, virtualization. And then common threads between these two uh, views is that industrial firm performing value creation process using inorganic machines. This is one of the core foundational view. And they both rely on industrial value creation process as a linear process of transforming raw material commodity into exchangeable uh, you know, the products and services. And that's the process that we went through. And in this process, you remember the binding of mater uh, the uh, function and form. Uh, so the binding is permanent and early, meaning that at the point of production, the binding is done. And then it uh, has uh, the process of value creation is to process, produce goods with irrevocable status through irreversible value creation process. Once product is made out of uh, natural resources, you cannot return um, into the, its old state, right? It remains, it retains its status as an inorganic machine and it remains the same. Therefore, product is a fossil of activities frozen in time and space through value creation process. What we have done in the process never changes, it remains the same. And then transfer of ownership is permanent and final uh, economic activities. IS discourse has been the basic uh, uh, focus was the transformation of industrial organizing 
leveraging the information from industrial economics to information economics. That's essentially what we have done over the last 40 years in our field. And all the topics that we have had, IT design, technology, adoption, virtualization, outsourcing, global supply chain, all the boring stuff that many of our uh, you know, journals have are all about the, um, you know, the, the attributes of that transformation. Now let's talk about generative economics. So uh, generative economics, in my view, is based on the rise of organic machines in, this, in the industrial uh, economics. And, and it deals with digitalization, deterritorialization, and, and the rise of organic machines. So you, many of you already read the articles in ISR paper. So there are a few core critical elements that led to those elements, digitalization, deterritorialization, and how they become organic machines. First one is a separation of form and functions, right? So this was a uh, you know, phone domain computing architecture. Therefore, the, what used to be combined on, uh, um, you know, um, um, undecoupled uh, or, or coupled, tightly coupled, is now um, you know, decoupled. The separation of contents media is uh, uh, through the work of Klaus Shannon. And then, so that creates the condition where the technology can constantly be uh, recombined. And, you know, the, the technology got separated in layers, and these layers in different modules uh, create a condition for people to reconnect, right? The second one is that we are now able to capture previously unavailable information. My speech is now being recorded. In the in old days, you the, the stories is very expensive. You don't do these things in a very high uh, level. If you have other data storage devices or sensors, you know, how many steps I take and, you know, what was my breathing, what was my heartbeat, all that information wasn't available, was not recorded, now we are recording it. Uh, and then that also leads to reverse semiotics, what I would call. So semiotics deals with the reference and referent, what is original and what is fake. Right? So information used to be fake. Information used to be a representation of the real. The article that is forthcoming in MISQ, we talked about digital first. Here, the information is the genetic material of the real. Information is no longer a fake representation of the real that is in the world, but information is the one that creates the world. Um, so the, I use this example all the time. Which one is the real? Neither of them are real. The real is what is in the uh, uh, ether of uh, digital ecosystem, infosphere, bits is real. And both of them are temporary binding of information in physical form, whether it's a screen or paper, right? In old days, before e-ticket was sanctioned as a law by law, the ticket was, had to be physically produced, early binding, the, the information and, uh, and, and the symbolic value of function and the paper ticket as a form got bound when the ticket was purchased, printed with irreversible status and sent it to you and you hold. Many of you are too young to know that we used to have a paper ticket. You know, boarding pass is the boarding pass. You don't reproduce boarding pass, uh, you know, at your whim, you know. Only the airline could produce the boarding pass as the true and authentic token of your transaction. And that transaction creates data which goes to the electronic reservation system. Now, in the new world, in two, since 2008, the data is the real. The only real that is being created when you purchase a ticket is the data, right? And then the data can produce boarding fake tickets. So which one's real? Uber is a just gigantic uh, printing machine for taxi as a service, right? And then Uber, uh, you know, Waymo car, Blue Dot is real and the car is fake, right? So uh, this is uh, John Baudrillard, the idea the simulation is no longer that of territory referential being of a substance generation by models of real without origin of reality. So the idea is that information is real is what is driving. Now, remember prediction is a commodity. Commodity is what is being transformed into marketable products and services. So prediction as a, a, a you know, the information based uh, computational prediction being the commodity is what is driving the generative economy. So deferred and temporary binding. So now I know that I can hold my commodity in non-material form 
And therefore, I can wait until that particular form of prediction needs a material manifestation and actualization in a particular context. And that creates value creation. So that can be wait until when it is uh, most relevant. So deferred and temporary binding of form and function. So physical goods became avatar of real digital goods. Uh, so product is a performative enactment. So instead of product being a fossil of prearranged activities in value creation, product is a live action of uh, activities orchestrated through algorithms across different value chains. So this is, the, uh, again, the model that we presented in that paper, Digital First article. So non-material digital resources through encoding, aggregation, computing. So this requires at least to the prediction uh, as an insight, perishable insight. That insight that is perishable, meaning that the value of that insight remains confined and temporary. So the fact that Youngjin is giving a talk now, therefore there is an insight about Youngjin's needs, which will not be valuable two hours later. So the longer, the shorter the, the value of the insight, the, the higher precision that you have, and that is more valuable. It's a counterintuitive. And, and therefore, and then when it happens, I want to bring physical resources to bear that particular insight in a material form to create value to those who are around that particular service. So that's the whole idea, right? So this is, uh, I'm going to skip. So what does this mean? This means that we are creating an organization that is dealing with much higher degree of contingencies than we ever had before. So the old industrial organizations with physical machines dealt with one contingency, that is mass production. There is a market of one, right? The black car, that's the car color of the uh, you know, fourth T. And then we had a market segmentation. We have you know, male and female and generations. And then we have a personalization. So each of you get one treatment, right? But you remain as a single person. Uh, it's an interesting. You as a single person, and um, you don't change, right? Let's see if we come back. Starbucks just created a different kind of model. Starbucks coffee maker, right? Coffee seller used to have a persona of forty people, forty different personas mapped into like a, a hundred thousand different people. Now pers uh, they use uh, big data uh, and AI generative machine uh, to um, to have. 320,000 different personas. And these personas are not bound to one person, but these personas, uh, one person can have multiple personas throughout the day. Right? So what I want to know is emergent contingencies. It's a temporal contingencies. And uh, or the organization's ability to deal with increased contingencies is the one that will determine their competitive advantage. So future firm is a nexus of algorithms that transform the perishable insights, temporary, into infosphere, uh, into value, in biosphere, in temporarily and situationally meaningful way. Meaning that a company that has an insight about what you want now, and then its ability to mobilize resources to meet the needs now, is the one who will win the competition rather than uh, rather than generic understanding of the market, right? So that, that's what, what is driving. So two core capabilities of the firms of the future are their ability to generate perishable computed insights, prediction, and then their ability to create embodiment of the insights into material goods and services, what I call printing. These are the two fundamental capabilities that future firms will have based on their org organic machines that will constantly generate new understanding of the state of, of the human needs. So uh, what does this mean for practitioner perspective? That means the value co-creation is on-demand, deferred, temporary, and recombinant configuration of distributed material, non-material resources through the live actions of algorithms. Right, so then we have data, physical resources, and algorithms and firm as a nexus of organic machines that can carry out print instruction to meet the dynamic contingencies at or near the point of use. Uh, and then what I would expect to see is the meta hierarchy that envelops from, uh, firms and markets. So if you think about firm 
and then we have a platform. Platform is an envelopment of market inside the firm. This is what uh, um, uh, Marshall Van Elsten and, and George Parker said, right? Inversion of a firm, meaning that the market is now inside an organizational hierarchy, but it is not full market, it's a, it is a controlled market inside my control of my ecosystem through boundary resources. I retain uh, my property right on certain boundary resources in the exercise of market. Therefore, the firm who creates uh, ecosystem inside my control boundary creates more value and retain more value. They, that's why their uh, valuation is much higher. But as the size of the market inside the semi-market, inside the ecosystem grows, the cost of transaction will continue to rise. So what, in or, uh, what the organic machine firm is likely to do is to then envelop that market even further to create or orchestrated consumption behaviors for the individuals so that you do not have to choose within Apple ecosystem. Ecosystem will tell you what I need. So it's going to be sub apps uh, as a subscription. I don't have to worry about which apps I want. An algorithm will choose what app I want. So think about the possibility, right? That will be the next model of hierarchy. Right? So this is a curation through by the meta hierarchy. The reason I call it meta hierarchy is that these hierarchies are extremely large. We see the early form of these hierarchies like Amazon and you know, Google and Apple. And they are resting on the power of the algorithms of organic machines, which do not likely to perform the same task twice because it is feeding um, with the data that is coming from the infrastructure, generating new insights that they think you want, and ability to mobilize resources to meet the needs on an ongoing basis, right? So that is the future of a firm that I think we are going into with uh, the rise of organic machines. And uh, so it is driven by the logic of generativity, the finishing up based on the commoditization of prediction. Managerial challenges, the deconstruction of products and industries as you know it. So a lot of companies are still struggling to figure out which industry I'm in, which vertical I'm in. It doesn't matter. Sustainability of natural resources is a big issue. This is why the deferred binding is an important um, uh, uh, issue because I do not want to act, uh, use physical resource until I really need, and I want to use minimum amount of physical resource to meet the needs of human, and then authenticity. When the, 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 uh, the information is real, and then information is subject to manipulation, so the, the users want to know whether this is authentic, right? And then authenticity is going to be an important aspect as in, in organic machines become the main driver of value creation. Economic logic is ec economies of prediction, economies of recombination, and economies of re-embodiment. Uh, so it, from economies of uh, uh, scale and, and scope, and then economies of marginal reproduction of information and zero cost of consumption, which is information economics. Now it is uh, economics of prediction, recombination, and uh, embodiment. I think we need a new form of the estimate of cost functions here. And then organizational uh, forms is, as I mentioned, meta hierarchy uh, with a loop. I think I'm going to stop here. Uh, I think that covers the, the future of a firm uh, and uh, with the rise of organic machines uh, as um, with AI being an example of such machines. The point I'd like to make is that AI should not be seen as uh, the machine of organic machine. I think it is a example of uh, emerging uh, organic machines. I expect we will see more of it. I think bio, uh, uh, you know, crisp technology, for example, single cell, you know, robotics and so on. There's a whole host, a whole host of really crazy innovations in, um, you know, engineering work that is going on that is beyond information systems, which all seem to converge into this convergence of biosphere and infosphere with highly generative and evolutionary patterns. So I do not want to confine the the organic machine into AI, but rather AI as an example, a class of uh, this new class of machines that I think is going to be extremely important. And that new class of machines 
uh, we are beginning to see the early uh, manifestation of their power, and I think we still do not fully understand what they do. Uh, but certainly, they change the uh, economic equations of industrial value creation and production. And I think that's why I believe this meta hierarchy uh, is an important construct we need to think about. So with that, I will stop here. So any, we have time to questions, or uh, maybe we should wrap it up. <laughs> thank you, thank you very well, much. Well, thank you. <laughs> any questions or comments? Yes? Um, a question on the scaling of the old traffic. You could say that the implications um, of this topic of AI only is feasible through large economies and large companies, um, or the other way around, how can small and medium-sized enterprises benefit from this if they don't even understand what's going on in this domain? Um, yeah, I think this is an interesting issue, right? You know, so, um, and at one point I, uh, I thought that uh, we, you know, in, in early 2000 when this whole internet revolution took place, the entry barrier of economic activities will be lower, and so anybody can be entrepreneur. To such an extent, it still is the case, but at the same time, you are extremely, uh, you know, dependent upon the provision of uh, basic infrastructure by other companies, right? So you are uh, subject to Amazon's uh, AWS uh, or Microsoft's um, Azure you know, infrastructure uh, in order for you to run your business. Uh, and so that's extremely expensive business to be in. And then without them, you as a small player simply do not uh, have means to start. Um, so I think that there is a, that tension. Uh, I have not personally fully you know, resolved that tension, but I think there is also, we see time to time, the new big players emerging from nothing. You know, like I said, a small player quickly gathering data, becoming tractions. And so there is this, uh, this sort of tendency of one gets become really big real fast, very quickly, uh, if they s succeed to move out of that sort of early stage. Uh, how does it happen? You know, uh, I think that's a question that we should uh, study further. No one really knows that initial. Maybe it is just random, you know, luck, um, or maybe there is a, some elements of uh, order and structure in that, uh, you know, in that process. Is that does that? Yes. Yeah. So, any other thoughts, questions? Yes, sir. So you started off your uh, whole argumentation with saying that uh, using big data. And Right. So uh, I, I uh, uh, appreciate the comments and uh, uh, questions. Uh, I get this uh, a lot. Uh, so there are a few things I'd like to say. Number one, um, I'm not making any value judgment of any of the predictions I make here. I didn't say the meta hierarchy is good or bad. Uh, and I didn't say uh, AI being able to make a prediction or prediction becoming a commodity is good or bad. 
It's just a sort of description of what I think is likely to happen. What I also did not mention at all is data, data high, uh, architecture um, um, in, in any part of my talk. Uh, the way you just described in the common practice is based on a particular type of data architecture that is common practice now. Um, and I don't think that will sustain itself. Uh, there are multiple different uh, models that are emerging highly and, and entirely uh, uh, compliant to GDPR as well as HIPAA and, and so on uh, that uh, protects uh, the or enhances your ability to protect your privacy uh, yet at the same time uh, offer ability to make predictions at, at larger scale. Um, so, uh, and then I think it is the rich domain of research and design research particularly, I think figuring out how we might do, uh, do that. I don't think uh, Google is in the business of data collection. They are in the business of creating um, service and their current architecture and their current business model uh, called for collection of data. It's almost like a production of pollution as a part of doing business. If there is a way that they rather not collect any data, but being able to offer predictions without holding the data, I think they might do. Uh, now, of course, there is different uh, use of your first party data to train your own model so that you can have more powerful model. I think, uh, so I don't think data is new oil. I think prediction is new oil. Uh, so uh, data doesn't mean anything if you do not have right algorithm. Uh, so uh, by moving away from the focus of ownership of data, but rather focusing on prediction actually will put the focus at the, on the right spot. Um, the companies uh, are doing stupid things like hospitals are holding my data and charging me when I want to take my in the in, in US. If I need uh, to move to another hospital, they'll make me pay to get my data, right? And it would, to me, it's ridiculous, right? Uh, and it's, uh, they should actually uh, give it away to me and then I sh should be the one who manages data. We have a perfect means to do it. Data architecture that we have is an evolution, historical evolution of the legacy architecture, the way we think about it, when the storage was very expensive and so on. And then data latency, the communication latency was extremely high. So the world in which we are moving into with, you know, extreme, the storage is the, you know, dirt cheap and then, uh, you know, latency is almost non-existent. What's going to have, uh, you know, happen with the data uh, architecture is, uh, is not likely to be what we have now. Therefore, the conversation of data privacy, based on what we have now, I think it's premature. Uh, so uh, there are huge opportunities for social technical research in that domain, right? Uh, and the last point I'd like to make is that, uh, yes, but you know, also privacy is highly um, subjective. Uh, and, and I think uh, the privacy uh, is highly contextual. What is private, what is valuable, private information, uh, is, is highly dependent on the context. Uh, I have met many of doctors, uh, the patients, uh, and survivors of heart attack, they said, you know, they, they, what they call uh, uh, pharma companies, uh, uh, the, the, the customers who raise their hands, that's what they say. So these are the people who, dis, the, who uh, waive their privacy to be part of any research that might save other people's lives for new drug development. They said, do it, right? So they, I think, they, now of course, like it's an exaggeration um, up to a certain extent. So there's, so th there's a, a lot of interesting things going on. So the question is the com company, sh when this uh, movement continues, I think we will have a day when the the ability to compete is not based on the ownership of data, but ability to use data. Therefore, you give me your data, the user, right? So I have a better means of using your data than anybody, anyone else. So if you give it to me, I will give something of a value back to you. Uh, so I think that transaction is what I, so therefore, you as an owner of the data as an individual will be in a control 
so that I determine who should I give my data for what reasons, right? So your doctor should not be the one that I, I'm controlling your data because I'm your doctor. Your doctor should be able to say, if I have your data and your Facebook and your uh, you know, Spotify and your how many times you open the refrigerator, I built an algorithm that will be able to help you better than my competitor across the street, another doctor, which is training on another algorithm. Therefore, you should give me not only the data that I have, you know, first party data, but also third party data that you have access to, give it to me, then I will be a, your better doctor, right? I think that's, that's the point of, uh, you know, competition that I think we will see more and more. Right, right. Um, but a question on your talk. So uh, you said you, 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 you're going to make it as a provocation, and I get that. I think it, it succeeded in a way. <laughs> because one of the books that I thought about pretty much pretty soon in your talk on, and it stuck the thinking, was Nelson and Winter 1980. Routine, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mainly because you use a lot of biologism, right? You right. talk about genes, um, about evolution, emergence, so classical biological mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And Nelson and Winter that into the theory of the yeah, science, well, yeah. routines, routines right, right, right. Um, and then a lot of management research has criticized this, this biologistic thinking. Um, and so I saw, saw an edge of provocation by you in, in a way returning to that. Now, I'm not saying that that's right. wrong or mm -hmm. anything, but could you elaborate a little bit on your relationship to the evolutionary economic stream where Nelson Winter located himself? In? Yeah, uh, I think uh, I'm... <laughs> Uh, in a way that uh, even more uh, closer to the evolutionary biology than uh, the earlier uh, scholars, as I believe they took their evolution, um, the image and theory as a, as a metaphor, whereas I am more, uh, I would argue, uh, uh, directly appropriating some of the evolutionary thinking in the theory development. Uh, and, and I really believe that there is no way around it if you uh, are dealing with uh, emergent behaviors. The biology uh, and evolutionary biology in particular, uh, there is a reason why the computational social science is heavily drawing upon the tools that were developed from evolutionary biology. Because that, that field of science was the one who had to confront with this emergent complex behavior before anybody else. And they are the one who actually had access to the raw information data that gives rise to these complex emergent behaviors. Winter Nelson didn't have access to that you know, research. Over the last 20 years, you know, the computational bio evolutionary biology just exploded. And and, 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 and at the same time, the information that we have in the, the world of social, social science also exploded and then exploding. Um, so I think we are in a position where we could actually do the empirical studies of, with such uh, theoretical orientation, but not as a metaphor, but with actual direct access to some of these data that are being generated so that we could understand these phenomena a little bit better. So, yeah. And what would be the underlying epistemology? Would that be critical realism? I mean, you talked a lot about actualization. Yeah, so I would, I would argue that uh, I would like to uh, characterize them as like a um, uh, ecological realistic view, uh, meaning that it is a realist view in, uh, in the sense that we take these things as real, but the real is the ecosystem, the information, um, you know, the, 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 the underlying uh, uh, realm of possibilities that creates these recombinations possibilities rather than the actual uh, particular momentary 
um, realization. And then, yeah, I think there's, the, 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 also, I, I think the critical realism is an important element because at the end of the day, uh, these are models, you know, that, 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 that we built to understand, have access to the real world phenomena. So in the sense, you know, you know, like uh, all, I think all uh, computational social science or all computational science is uh, critical realist in the sense when, when they say the com complex uh, modeling, you know, so when they say that, uh, you know, ant colony has an emergent property that has computational thing, there is no central computer that does computation. These ants are simply following the chemical dropping of other ants, and they, they, they show this emergent behavior that, that can be modeled using compu computer models. Um, same thing with immune systems and so on. So, but these are like, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, our uh, epistemological tool that we build, right, to understand this behavior. So, so in that sense, that's sort of the two sort of uh, issues, I think, uh, the views that I would hold in, in understanding. Yeah. Any, any other thoughts before we close? Any, any students? No? No questions from students? Too much? Crazy? Well, thank you. Thank you for listening. And uh, thank you all for attending. And um, yeah, thank you very much for coming and for talking. All right, thanks. <laughs>